Saka's questions to the Blessed One. And so let's just see. We've got the recording on. Seems looks fine. And we have the text here. And so in the last part or the previous episode, part two, we just finished off where the Buddha answers Saka. Um, he says on the topic of the conquest of craving as um, we just heard that desire is the cause of love and hatred and so Saka asks well then what is the cause of desire and then we heard about the conquest of craving and as the Buddha finished off saying he said that Saka I teach two kinds of pleasant feeling, Vedana. The pleasant feeling that is to be harbored and the pleasant feeling that is to be avoided. And what the Buddha meant here was that if you know that a pleasant feeling helps to develop unwholesome states of consciousness and hamper wholesome states of consciousness you shouldn't harbor such a feeling but if you know that a pleasant feeling helps to develop wholesome states of consciousness and hamper the unwholesome states of consciousness one should harbor such a feeling and then the Buddha said the pleasant feeling is of two kinds which is bound up with thinking and reflection and the other which has nothing to do with these mental activities vitaka vichara and so that means that one of these consciousnesses is bound up with thinking and mental activity and the Buddha states categorically of these two, the pleasant feeling that has nothing to do with vitaka vicharya is much superior. And we just finished off learning that vitaka and vichara are translators, uh, translated as thought conceptions and thinking in Jnana Tiloka's Buddhist dictionary. And so Today we're going to be starting on the next chapter in the text called... Oh, and please make sure that you can uh, grab the text below. That I'll put the link below and also the links to the previous episodes. And so you can get to look at the text. We're just about a third down in the text. At the title of Pleasant Feeling and Unwholesome Thoughts. And so, just with a uh, little bit of catching up from where we left off at the last time, I think that we should get into some reading. And I'm here at the Buddha Center in the Deer Park. Okay. So I actually want a bit like so. And let me just get that window here. And so before we begin, let me just do a formal intro. Namotasa. 
பக்கவாத்து அரஹத்து சம்மா சம்புத்தசா Homage to the Blessed One, the Worthy One, and the Rightly Self-Awakened One. Okay, so I'm going to jump over to the text here and get into the reading. But I just want to make sure that there's not any weird things popping up on the screen. So I, I don't want to get that crazy weird thing all over the place. Okay, so pleasant feeling and unwholesome thoughts. Pleasant feeling that lead to unwholesome thoughts are rooted in sensual objects. Most people are preoccupied with sensual objects such as sex and food. If they get what they want, they rejoice, but their joy leads to more desire and the so-called happiness of many people is founded on desire. If their desire is not fulfilled, they are frustrated and unhappy. This means the emergence of unwholesome thoughts that bring into play the agents of expansion with tanha, mana and ditti, which means craving, conceit and belief or view. These pleasant feelings that we should avoid are mentioned in the Salayatana Vibhanka Sutta which is the analysis of the sixth sensing medium of the Majjhima Nikaya. The sutta likens the sensual objects of human dwellings because they keep people in confinement. People derive pleasure from contact with them or from recollections of their contact. There are six kinds of pleasant feelings rooted in uh, six sense objects and their respective sense organs. Excuse me, I'll just get some water. <coughs> okay. The way to avoid pleasant, the way the way to avoid pleasant but unwholesome feelings is to be mindful at the moment of seeing, etc. If sensual thoughts cause pleasure, the yogi must note and recite them. But the beginner in, med in meditation cannot follow and note all the mental processes. So he starts with the object of contact and becomes aware of one of the primary elements, viz. earth, water, heat and wind, patawi, earth, appo, water, tejo, heat, and wind, wayo. In Satipatthana, in the Satipatthana Sutta, the Buddha says, gachanto wa gachamiti pajanati. The yogi knows that he walks when walking. This saying refers to clear awareness of the rigidity and motion, the wayo element, or the wind or air element. But as he notes walking, the yogi is also a r aware of the rigidity and motion, hardness and softness, the patawi element, which is the earth element, in the feet and in the body, also of the warmth 
cold and lightness the techo element uh, the heat element or the heaviness and dampness the apo element the water element the apo element is intangible but can be known through contact with other elements that are bound up with it so we don't really directly experience the water element in other ways that when it manifests itself in our experience as heaviness because it has been bound up with one of the other elements such as the, pat the patawi element the earth element in the in this way we know that if you add water to sand it becomes mud and mud is heavier because it holds the water and so the heaviness and the dampness is the sign of the apo element continuing with the text the yogis at our meditation center begin with contact and motion in the abdomen that are most obvious and easy to note while sitting the tenseness and motion in the abdomen are the marks of the vayu element, the air element. They practice noticing in their own common language the rising and falling of the belly. This practice has helped many yogis to attain insights and make much progress on the holy path. In the beginning, the yogi constantly watches the abdominal rising and falling. He notes any mental event that occurs while engaged in such concentration. A feeling of joy may arise, but it disappears when it is noted. It usually does not intrude if the yogi keeps on watching the rising and falling. When the Buddha speaks of unwholesome joy, it means that we should focus on Nama Rupa in order to hit off the sensual joy and that if such joy arises, we should not uh, we should note and reject it at once. And that was the chapter on pleasant feeling unwholesome thoughts and now we continue with wholesome joy then there is the wholesome joy which the Buddha describes as follows in the same sutta having realized the impermanence and dissolution of rupa the yogi knows that all the rupas that he has seen before and those he is seeing are subject to anicca and dukkha. This insight knowledge causes joy, and such joy may be described as, as the pleasant feeling rooted in liberation from sensual desire. This part of the teaching in the sutta. This is part of the teaching in the sutta still referring to the Salayatana Vibhanka Sutta um, the Sutta on the analysis of the six senses it touches on such things as renunciation, distress and as we hear here the joy that comes from mm, renouncing the world it's strange that there would be joy bound up with leaving the, the sensual world um, but surely there is continuing on the commentary adds that the yogi is joyful because he attains insight into impermanence etc as a result of his mindfulness of the six sense objects such joy is wholesome and desirable the commentary describes four kinds of wholesome joy. The joy due to renunciation of worldly affairs, which was, was the one I was just referring to. Number two, 
the joy associated with vipassana practice. Vipassana means to see clearly. Uh, number three, the joy based on contemplation of the Buddha, etc. And the joy resulting from absorption in the first jhana, which is the fourth kind. Some are joyful when they think of their renunciation of worldly affairs, their ordination as bhikkhus, practice of vinaya, um, the basket of morality, concentration, and so forth. This, this joy is wholesome since it is bound up with renunciation or disassociation from secular life. So are the feelings of joy that we have when we hear a sermon on the Dhamma or when we go to a meditation center for practice of vipassana. The joy dependent on vipassana may uh, the joy dependent on vipassana may be the joy that arises while being mindful. In particular, the highest joy is the joy associated with emergence of the Uddhaya Bhaya Jnana, insight into the arising and passing away of all phenomena. The joy, uh, the joy that we have when we contemplate the Buddha, etc., is obvious. I think etc. here means the Buddha and the Dhamma and the Sangha. I couldn't imagine what it could mean other than that. The commentaries say that concentration on the joy derived from the contemplation of the Buddha, of the Dhamma, of the Sangha, so there you go, of morality, oh, so the six contemplations, of lip. Uh, liberality and of heavenly beings can bring about knowledge and fruition on the path. Even arahantship may be attained if the yogi notes and reflects on the dissolution and cessation of joy, piti, which is the Pali word for joy. Um, that. So, uh, okay, let me start here. Even if the arahant may, even arahantship may be attained if the yogi notes and reflects on the dissolution of and cessation of joy, piti, that is born of the six contemplations. So, if you note the cessation of the arisen joy that comes from thinking of the Buddha, when you see the joy fading away and ceasing, this can make you an arahant, a fully enlightened being. Continuing on, pity implies joy and obviously the joy derived from the six contemplation is wholesome and so is the joy based on the three jhanas or their upachara, their neighborhood jhana. Of the four kinds of renunciation, nikkama, joining the holy order means liberation from matrimonial ties, and so does the vipassana practice, since it is opposed to matrimony and all sensual objects. So the commentary on the e on the itivu, itivutaka describes ordination first, jhana. Nibbana, Vipassana, and all wholesome Dhamma as Nikkama. The joy which is marked by Vitaka Vichara is of two kinds. Uh, there is happiness, Sukha, that is associated with excess concentration, Upachara Samadhi, excess concentration, and happiness associated with the first jhana. Then, as mentioned before, there are various types of mundane joy. This joy over one's ordination, 
joy that results from vipassana practice. Joy over the contemplation of the Buddha, uh, etc. The six contemplations. Again, we have four kinds of supramundane joy associated associated with the four paths of the first jhana. Superior to these types of joy are those that have nothing to do with vitaka vichara. These are the attribute, attributes of the second jhana that is marked by ecstasy, joy, one-pointedness of mind, ikakata, and the third jhana marked by joy and ikakata, um, one-pointedness. Such jhanic joy is mundane joy. Likewise, the joy derived from the four supramund supramundane paths and the second and third jhana are free from vitakko jhara and therefore ho wholesome. These second and third jhanic joys are far higher than the first jhanic joys and the joy associated with the wholesome thoughts in, sensual, in the sensual sphere. And so is the vipassana joy resulting from attentiveness to, second, to the second and third jhanic joy. A, discuss, a discussion of these joys with or without vitakka vichara is above the comprehension of those who have little knowledge of scriptures. It can be understood thoroughly only by those who have attained the jhanas. According to the commentary, when Saka asked the Buddha how to overcome desire, conceit and belief, tanha, mana and ditti, he was, as he was asking the Lord about the vipassana practice on the Aryan path. The Buddha stressed wholesome pleasure, wholesome displeasure and wholesome indifference, upekka, or equanimity as the remedy. It may be hard for common people to understand, but the Buddha's answer was relevant to the question. For the devas, for the devas mind is more obvious than matter among the elements of mind feeling is more obvious than others. So the Buddha told Saka to watch his feelings, Vedana. In many of the Buddha's teachings on vipassana contemplation of Rupa takes precedence over that of consciousness. This is also true of the Saka Panha Sutta, but here no mention is made of Rupa since it is implicit in the contemplation of feeling. And feeling is one of the four satipatthana, which, which goes body, feeling, thoughts and dhammas. And that concludes section here on wholesome joy. Continuing on in the text and now we are at Vipassana contemplation. So we're almost halfway through the text for anyone who's following along. Vipassana contemplation the object of vipassana practice is to note all psychophysical phenomena uh, that arise from contact with sense objects. It involves the effort to see empirically all phenomena as they really are together with the characteristics such as impermanence, etc. There is uh, impermanence, there is suffering and there is non-self the three characteristics. <coughs> uh, 
Let me just get some water. At first, the Yuki cannot focus on every Namo Ruba process, and so he should begin with a few obvious events. He must note walking when he walks and so on. He must watch every body bodily behavior. In this way, he, sh he usually becomes aware of the Wayo and other primary elements. And the Wayo is the wind element or the air element. This accords with the teachings of the Satipatthana Sutta Kachanto Va Kachamiti Pachanati. The yogi knows that when he is walking. Oh, I'm sorry. The yogi knows that he is walking when he is walking. The yogi tends to be slack if he focuses on one posture say sitting and so in order to keep him mindful we instruct him to focus on the rising and falling of the belly with the development of concentration he becomes aware of the vayu element you know, rigid rigidity and motion um, whenever he focuses on ri on rising and falling later Later on, there dawns on him the distinction between the rising or falling and consciousness, between lifting a foot and consciousness, and so forth. This, dis this discriminative insight into Nama Rupa is called Nama Rupa, uh, Nama Rupa Paricheda Jnana. With the further development of concentration, the yogi knows that he the <laughs> with the further development of concentration, the yogi knows that he bends his hand because of his desire to bend, that he sees because of his eyes and the object to be seen, that he knows because of the object to be known, that he that he does not know because of his unmindfulness, that he likes a thing because of his ignorance, that he seeks to fulfill his desire because of his attachment, that good or bad results follow his actions, and so on. This is Pachaya Pa Pachaya Parigaha. Pachara Parigahanyana, or insight into the primacy of the law of cause and effect. Pachaya Parigahanyana, insight into the primacy of the law of cause and effect. This is followed by Samsana jnana, which means insight into the anicca, dukkha and anatta of all phenomena, which means impermanent suffering and non-self of all phenomena. An insight born of reflection on their arising and passing away. Then the yogi knows that everything arises and vanishes rapidly. His perception is so keen that nothing escapes his attention. He tends to see lights and to be overly ecstatic and joyful. This is the pleasant feeling that arises together with the extraordinary insight Uttayabhaya Jnana into the flux of Nama, Nama Rupa. It also surpasses all other kinds of joy and is described as a mental state that we should welcome the Dhammapada speaks of the surpassing joy, Ratti, that occurs to the yogi who contemplates the Dhamma, that is, Nama Rupa, in a flux rightly. He derives joy and ecstasy, and this state of consciousness is called Amata, 
the deathless because it is the forerunner of Nibbana which the yogi will surely attain if he strives for it with faith and faith will and diligence the joy and ecstasy are called pamoja and piti in pali pamoja is the joy that occurs with the emergence of samsana jnana while piti means extreme joy that accompanies the udaya bhaya jnana the rapid perception of the arising and dissolution of phenomena it develops while the yogi is mindful of the rising and falling of the belly or the sensations in the body or while his attention is focused on his bodily movements he he rarely suffers unbearable pain if pain if pain occurs sometimes it vanishes instantly when he notes it and then he feels very much elated the elation continues to be intense as long as he is mindful of the rapidity with which every phenomenon arises and passes away as in the first three jhanas the yogi feels very feels very happy when he attains the uddaya bhaya jnana he describes his pleasant oh i'm sorry he describes his happiness at this stage as ineffable experience that surpasses all similar states of consciousness in the sakkapanna sutta it is it is labeled sevita pasoma sevita pasomansa so in the sakkapanna sutta it is labeled sevita basso mansa that's a new word for me uh that is the pleasant feeling that we should seek sevita basso mana basso mansa sevita basso mansa and that concludes this chapter on vipassana contemplation Let me just see how far. Okay, so we're 30 minutes in. This next chapter is going to be a long one. And when we finish this all, we'll be um over halfway through the text. And so I might cut this video or this part up at the end of this chapter because it's almost like three chapters long. comparing it to the previous ones. And so seems that we could finish strong on this. Here we go. Unpleasant feeling that should be sought or avoided. The sutta mentions two kinds of unpleasant feeling. The unpleasant feeling that leads to unwholesome karma, acts, words or thoughts. and the unpleasant feeling that results in wholesome karma the form the former is to be avoid, avoided while the latter is to be welcomed the latter is not to be deliberately sought but it is to but it is commended because it is conducive to the practice of jhana the holy path and its fruition The Salayatana Vibhanga Sutta tells us what kind of sorrow we should welcome and what kind of uh, sorrow we should avoid. We usually we usually grieve over the failure to get pleasant desirable sense objects or over the lack of these objects in the past. We are unhappy when we have to face dangers in the future. or when we think of suffering etc in the past such unpleasant feelings do us no good 
but produce only pain and unwholesome thoughts. These unpleasant feelings are a hindrance to good deeds. Those who harbor them cannot make devotions before the Buddha image. Even while making devotions, they are so distracted that they lack seal and concentration. A calm mind is essential if contemplation of the Buddha is to be worthwhile. Without it, there will be only unwholesome thoughts. So we should try to overcome these feelings. Yet there are some people who seem to welcome suffering. They may not like if you... Oh, I'm sorry. They may not like you if, for example, you tell them not to grieve over the loss of their beloved one. On the contrary, they may think they may thank you when you say something to justify their grief. We should keep in mind the law of karma or the Buddha's teaching that everything happens according to one's actions and bear our misfortunes calmly. The best remedy in such a crisis is to practice is the practice of samatha or vipassana. If sorrow grief or depression afflicts us during meditation hours, such unwholesome states of consciousness must be noted and removed. The Buddha describes the Satipatthana method as the only way to get over grief and end all suffering. So long as we keep uh, ourselves mindful according to the Satipatthana teaching, we never feel dis we never feel depressed and if depression arises it arises it passes away when we focus our attention on it there are many things in life that makes one unhappy such as frustration of desire lack of success loss of property and so forth brooding over our misfortunes leads to depression but we should get over it through mindfulness and our method is to watch constantly the abdominal rising and falling the act of sitting etc the, pra the practice of mindfulness was crucial to Saka for in the face of imminent death that would surely bring about the loss of heavenly bliss and sensual pleasure. He was much depressed. So the Buddha's teaching was realistic and very important. We will now give a translation of the Pali texts in the Salyatana Vibhanga Sutta about the unpleasant feeling that we should welcome. After having observed and realized the impermanence of the present visual form, rupa, the dissolution and passing away, the yogis gain a true insight into the nature of things as they are, that is, into their anicca, dukkha, etc. Uh, we could just add anatta as well, anitya dukkha and anatta. And so there arises in him the desire for the goal of the Aryan path, the matchless and the noblest freedom. He looks forward to the day when he would attain the abode of the Aryan who have won such freedom. This longing for the Aryan liberation causes pain and sorrow. This unpleasant feeling is called Nikama Sita Domanasa. That is, Domanasa, pain or sorrow due to desire for renunciation. 
we should remember that. Those who observe the psychophysical phenomena as they arise from the six as they arise from the six senses realize their impermanence, etc., and with their mere heresy uh, knowledge of the Aryan Dhamma, they may keep on meditating in hope of attaining the goal. But if their hopes does not materialize in due course, they will get dejected. This is the mental pain caused by the desire for renunciation. This needs some explanation. The yogi who lacks experience in samatha jhana oh i'm sorry the yogi who lacks experience in samatha jhana or samadhi begins with nama rupa arising from six sense organs but it is not easy for a beginner to follow their process thoroughly so he would be well advised to begin with the four primary elements as suggested in the Visuddhimaka um, uh, of with Vayu element in the abdomen in terms of common language as a method that we teach at our meditation center. So a beginner should begin as uh, described in the Visuddhimaka with the air element at the uh, abdomen or in the belly uh, the belly rises and falls we experience the pressure and the release from this pr uh, pressure in the abdomen continuing on while he is mindful of the rising and falling of the abdomen he must note any thought intention desire etc sensation heat, pain, or contact with sense objects, seeing, hearing, etc. that occurs. But the true nature of Nama Rupa is not apparent when concentration is weak. With the development of sama the I'm sorry. With the development of samadhi, the mind is calm, pure and free from hindrances. Every thought or feeling is noted and removed. The yogi is then at the stage of citta visuddhi, purification of mind. Later on, later on, he knows the distinction between the cognizing nama and the cognized ruba, rupa, which also means naming nama name and form or forming rupa. This is the discriminative insight into nama rupa. Nama rupa parichedanyana and purification of view ditti visuddhi. The yogi gains insight into the distinction between cause and effect. Pachaya parigahanyana and he is then free from all doubts. Kanka Vitara with I'm sorry. Kanka Vitaran Visuddhi. The yogi now realizes that every phenomenon is subject to anicca, dukkha and anatta, impermanent suffering and non self. This is Sammasasana san this is Sammasana jnana. He quickly perceives the instant dissolution of everything that arises, Udaya Bhaya jnana. At this stage there arises in the yogi the desire to be liberated. He longs to attain a certain stage on the holy path and he hopes to do so within a certain period of time. If his hope is not fulfilled, he is sad and disappointed, a prey to doubt and despair.
but since this feeling may serve him oh I'm sorry but since this feeling may serve as an incentive for further effort it is a blessing in disguise although it is not to be sought deliberately of course the best thing for the yoki to do is to make uninterrupted progress from the outset so that the insights and experiences will afford him much pleasure. So the sutta lays emphasis on the joy rather than the sorrow to be derived from renunciation. Never, nevertheless, for the yogi who fails to achieve success within this target date, depression is inevitable. At our meditation center, we explain successive stages of insight to a few qualified yogis to help them evaluate their experiences. We confine the teachings to the select few because it serves no purpose in the case of those who have no experience in meditation. It is beneficial only to the experienced yogis in so far as it serves as a spur to further effort. Those who hope to hear our teaching without having gained sufficient insights are dejected over the non-fulfillment of their wish. But this, de but this dejection will do them good since it makes them exert more effort and leads to experiences which accord with our teachings and which they can evaluate joyfully. Some yogis are disheartened because of their weak concentration at the outset, but as a result some redouble their effort and attain unusual insights. So the yogi may benefit by his despair at this stage. According to the commentary, we should welcome the despair that results from the non-fulfillment of desire in connection with renunciation, meditation, reflection, anusati, and jhana. We should turn to good account. Uh, we should turn to good account the despair or sorrow over our inevitability to become a bhikkhu, to practice meditation or even to hear the Dhamma or visit a pagoda. As an example of the wholesome sorrow, there is the story of a Buddhist woman in Sri Lanka, Ceylon. The woman's parents went to a pagoda leaving their daughter at home as she was uh, in the family way. Um, the, the pagoda being not far away, she saw it illuminated and heard the Dhamma being recited by monks. Her heart sank at the thought of the bad karma that made her unable to go along with her parents. But then she rejoiced over the good karma of the pilgrims at the pagoda. Her rejoicing turned into ecstasy. Ubikapiti. And suddenly she rose into the air and found herself on the platform of the pagoda. Thus wholesome sorrow helped to bring about the fulfillment of a woman's wholesome desire miraculously. This commentary on the Sakabana Sutta cites the story of Mahasiwa of Mahasiwa Tera as an example of a wholesome sorrow that leads to Arahantship. Mahasiwa Tera was a great teacher who had many disciples. Those who practiced Vipassana under his guidance became arahats. Seeing that his teacher had not yet attained the supreme goal, 
one of these arahats asked him for a lesson in the Dhamma. Mahasiva said that he had no time to teach the lesson as he was engaged in the holy day. Oh, I'm sorry, as he was engaged the whole day answering the questions of his disciples, removing their doubts and so forth. Then the bhikkhu said, Sir, you should let at least have you should at least have the time to contemplate the Dhamma in the morning. As matters now stand, you will not have even the time to die. You are the mainstay of other people, but you have no support for your own self. I do not therefore want your lesson. So saying, he rose into the air and went away. I heard that he flew out of the window and left the, the venerable elder uh, quite stupefied. Uh, but continuing on. Now Mahasiva realized that the bhikkhu had come not to learn the Dhamma but to warn him against self-complacency. Thus disillusioned, he left the monastery and retired to a secluded place where he practiced vipassana strenuously. But despite his persistent and painstaking effort, he failed to have any unusual insight and even after many years, he was still far from his goal. At last he became very much depressed and was shedding tears when a goddess appeared and stayed and started crying. <laughs> the Terra asked her why she was crying, and she said that she thought she could attain insights by crying. This brought the Terra to his sense. He pulled himself together, practiced mindfulness, and having passed through successive stages of illumination on the holy path, he finally attained arahantship. After all insight, after all insight, is an experience that the yogi can attain in a short time under favorable circumstances. The Tera's initial failure, despite his strenuous effort, might have been due to discursive thinking that stemmed from his extensive learning. This is a key point. Uh, so it was actually Vitaka Vichara that ended up holding the elder back. And it's such a funny story where this goddess, she comes and she just starts crying and crying and <laughs> the elder looks up and he's like, surely there must be a reason that this radiant being is crying here. And then he asks it, her, why are you crying? And then she says, Well, venerable sir, I thought that crying was the way to Nibbana, because she had seen this venerable elder who, whose students become arahants, fully enlightened beings. And so she thought, the goddess thought, that if she started crying, maybe she would become enlightened. And then this elder became, uh, he became jolted by this and uh, this made him see to, to practicing correctly. Continuing on. Um, yes, so we just ended off with hearing that the Tira's initial failure, uh, despite his strenuous effort in teaching others to become enlightened, would have been to the discursive thinking or the overthinking of his own uh, extensive learning. So sometimes good things can hold us back from attaining good. Continuing on. Thus, the sorrow which promoted Tera Mahasiwa to make further effort on the path, on the path is a kind of wholesome sorrow that we should welcome. The Sakkapana Sutta mentions two kinds of wholesome sorrow, uh, one with Vitaka Vichara, discursive thinking, and the other without it, 
But in reality every sorrow is bound up with thinking and we speak of sorrow without thinking only metaphorically. In short, sorrow is unwholesome if it originates in sensual desire or worldly affairs and so we should avoid thoughts that lead to such sorrow. If it arises spontaneously, we must not harbor it. We should fix the mind on other objects and sorrow will vanish of its own accord. On the other hand, sorrow is wholesome when it arises from frustration over any effort to promote one's spiritual life such as the effort to join the holy order, the effort to attain insights, and so forth. We should welcome such sorrow, for it may spur effort and lead to progress on the holy path. Very important. Let me just read again. We should welcome such sorrow, for it may spur effort and lead to progress on the holy path. It is not, however, to be sought deliberately. This is also important. The best thing is to have wholesome joy in the search for enlightenment. Indeed. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And so friends, I think I'm going to end this episode here. And for the next episode, we're going to be just at the halfway mark of this talk. Um, yeah, so I've got something popping up on my screen here. It's very ridiculous. Uh, but anyway, I was just saying that um, in the next uh, episode, we're going to be looking at wholesome and unwholesome upekka, equanimity, um, or upekka, they had another word for it, indifference, I guess. So, yep, that will be for the next episode, and this was um, part three to the series on the study of the Sekapanha Sutta as we're reading this talk given by the Venerable Mahasi Sayadaw. And so I would just like to say um, thank you for listening and let me just close off all of this Chippa Java nonsense and we could maybe finish off up in the trees. Let's just see. This looks fine. Yeah, and so thank you so much for listening and make sure to check out part one part two and we just finished part three this one and we'll probably get up to maybe six or seven parts for this talk as we go through it and yeah I think that's all for today and so just going to meditate for a few minutes and let me just say thank you for your attention and may you be free from suffering and find true peace and happiness thank you